If you look hard enough into the events of any movie, you will always find at least something that doesn't quite add up, whether it is minuscule and inconsequential or so big it derails the entire narrative. Too often, these plot holes become the talking point over anything else, and so eager are certain pockets of the internet to find these inconsistencies, a perfectly valid explanation within the film itself is completely ignored. Now we do already have a video out on this topic, but there were just so many more to talk about. So, I'm Ellie with What Culture, here with 10 more glaring plot holes you didn't realise the movie actually solved. Number 10. Why was there gravity in the dream's third level, Inception? Almost automatically, because Inception is a Christopher Nolan film, there were elements and aspects that were confusing. Even after an explanation, things aren't always clear, and it takes more than a few rewatches to understand fully, if at all. One head scratcher that the 2010 blockbuster presented had to do with gravity gravity and how it affected each layer of the dream the crew were in. The first layer had them driving around in a van before heading into the second layer. When the vehicle drove off a bridge, the next level of the dream subsequently experienced no gravity. And this is where the mind-boggling fight scene with Joseph Gordon-Levitt jumping all over the hotel corridor walls came from. However, in spite of level 2 experiencing no gravity, level 3 had no issues at all, feet firmly planted on the ground. This has been taken as a plot hole, but it can be explained by one line from Tom Hardy's Eames. Before the van hit freefall on level 1, there was some rumbling felt on level 2 that Eames thought was too close to be turbulence from the reality of the plane, and so surmises it must be from the van driver in the previous level. The takeaway from this is that the effects of the upper levels get weaker the deeper they go into the dreams, so by this logic, being more than one level removed from the weightlessness in the van means that they are far enough away that they don't feel it. Do you get that? Number 9. Why didn't Thanos just double the universe's resource, Avengers Infinity War? When the Avengers, the Guardians of the Galaxy, and almost every living MCU hero came together to fight Thanos in Avengers Infinity War, they were up against the greatest villain the franchise has ever produced. Thanos didn't want money or power, and it wasn't petty revenge he was after. He wanted to correct the universe. Thanos's plan to collect the Infinity Stones and indiscriminately snap away half of all life was designed to save the half that was left. The method may be questionable, but it was certainly a motivation that was easy to understand and empathise with. A common argument against Thanos' plan is that he simply could have taken the stones and doubled all of the universe's resources rather than halving its population, a move that would have rendered the entire movie redundant. However, why Thanos would never do this is explained right there during a conversation with Gamora. The Mad Titan came up with his plan long before he got his hands on the Infinity Stones, and he went around planet by planet slaughtering half of every population. And as he explained to his favourite daughter later, his method worked. The people of her home planet had known nothing but full bellies and clear skies since his correction. He had proved that his method was effective, so why would he suddenly change course to double the universe's resources when this would eventually be outdated by continually rising populations anyway? Number 8. How was Rey a match for Kylo Ren? so quickly, Star Wars Episode 7 The Force Awakens. Throughout the history of the Star Wars universe, there have been countless powerful characters introduced. Not all of them are created equally, however, and there are some that, at certain points in time, were just stronger than others. This was certainly the case with Daisy Ridley's Rey and Adam Driver's Kylo Ren. By the end of the trilogy, Rey Skywalker became an incredibly powerful Jedi, but it took a journey to get there. Much like Luke Skywalker, in her first appearance, she was a novice in the Jedi arts with a lot to learn. Yet she was able to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Kylo Ren in her first lightsaber fight experience. Against the grandson of Anakin Skywalker, no less, the Jedi newbie shouldn't have stood a chance, and Star Wars fans have made this opinion felt on the internet ever since 2015. However, this wasn't a level playing field, and Ben Solo was fighting at a distinct disadvantage. In the 10 minutes prior to their coming together, Ren had been through a lot, both physically and emotionally. He had killed his own father, he'd been shot in the leg with a powerful weapon, and had been wounded by Finn in a fight that he hadn't taken particularly seriously. Add this to the fact that he was trying to recruit Rey rather than kill her, and it makes perfect sense that he wasn't at his best either physically or mentally, and that Rey was able to give him a fight. Number 7. Why didn't Dolores tell the family that Bruno was still there? Encanto. Though Mirabelle is undoubtedly the main character in Encanto, much of the narrative anchors around her uncle Bruno. 
Bruno, the visions that he had and how he was perceived by the family. Upon seeing a future that suggested Mirabel may destroy the miracle that granted the Madrigal family their abilities, he fled to protect her. The family, particularly his mother, turned on him and wouldn't hear a single word said about her son. There was one character, however, Mirabel's cousin, Dolores, who had two traits that by all logic should have resulted in Bruno being found still living in the house. Firstly, she could hear everything, and proudly admitted at the story's conclusion that she heard him every day. And secondly, throughout the movie she proved herself to be pretty rotten at keeping secrets. Why then didn't she tell anyone that Bruno was still there? Well, thanks to the song that took the world by storm in 2021, even those who have never seen Encanto probably know that they don't talk about Bruno. During the film's opening musical number, Mirabel merely said the word Bruno and the entire town in unison broke her off. It stands to reason that Abuela would have had the same reaction had Dolores even attempted to bring him up in conversation. And then there's the fact that she actually did subtly confess that she knew to Mirabel while they were singing We Don't Talk About Bruno. She told her that she could always hear him muttering and mumbling, but that little nugget of information was completely ignored. But at least she tried. Also, you're all very welcome because I'm certain that at least half of you now have We Don't Talk About Bruno stuck in your heads. You're welcome. Number 6. Why would the aliens invade a planet they were deathly allergic to? signs. Typically, when you go into any movie written and directed by M. Night Shyamalan, you can expect there will be big twists before the credits roll. In The Sixth Sense, it was that Bruce Willis had been dead the whole time, spoiler alert. In Unbreakable, it was that Samuel L. Jackson's Mr. Glass was behind everything, again, spoiler alert. And in Signs, it was that the invading aliens were allergic to water. This has been called out as a plot hole by many, who say that if the aliens were so vulnerable to as little as a drop of H to O, why did they invade a planet 70% of which was comprised of water? There is a popular fan theory that suggests the aliens weren't in fact aliens, but demons, and that they were reacting to holy water. However, you don't have to look to fan theories when the answer is categorically presented within the confines of the movie itself. There is an easily missed line where someone on the radio claims that Earth is actually experiencing a raid rather than an invasion. It may sound like splitting hairs, but there is a distinction that makes a big difference. With it being a raid, the aliens didn't come for the planet or to stay for long as they would have with an invasion. Instead, as Earth would be the only place to find a nice healthy crop of humans, they were looking to abduct and move on with minimal water contact. Number 5. How did Sarah Connor know how to use a hydraulic press, the Terminator? In 1984, the Terminator introduced two iconic action movie heroes in Sarah Connor and Arnie's T-800 model Terminator pitting them against each other as the latter was sent back in time to kill the former to prevent her son from being born and sparking a revolution in the future. During the adrenaline fueled final battle between the two, Sarah was able to comprehensively defeat the T-800 by crushing it under a hydraulic press. The moment is full of tension as the villainous robot reaches out for Sarah's throat, but at just the right moment she finds the button to lower the press and wins the day. The plot hole here is that there is absolutely no reason as to why John Connor's mother would know how to operate such a piece of machinery. It wasn't a process of elimination and it wasn't guesswork. She knew exactly which button to press and went to it immediately. Those that do call this a plot hole, however, must have missed a key scene from just moments earlier. While Sarah was trying to evade the Terminator, she accidentally hit that very button and accidentally started to lower the press. When it came time to lower it again, only this time with Arnie underneath, she knew exactly what needed to be done and did it with no hesitation. Number 4. Why didn't they teach the astronauts to drill Armageddon. There are people all over the internet that will call out plot holes in movies no matter how significant or meaningful. But when the star of the movie itself is asking the question, it must be something big. This was the case when Ben Affleck referenced an issue he brought up with Michael Bay on the Armageddon DVD special features. As he explained, the actor who played AJ Frost asked director Michael Bay why NASA would train oil drillers to be astronauts rather than astronauts to be oil drillers, to which he was famously 
told to shut up. However, the answer to his question is explained perfectly in the film itself. Ben Affleck's complaint is actually inaccurate, as NASA weren't training the oil drillers to become astronauts, they were just training them enough to survive in space and to undertake the work needed. No spacewalking and no crazy astronaut stuff, just drilling. There were still real astronauts with them to take control of the bulk of the mission. There is also the fact that the perceived flaw oversimplifies the role of the drillers. NASA did, in fact, attempt to train their astronauts how to use Harry Stamper's drill, but the thing was so complicated that they couldn't. They make good astronauts, but they don't know jack about drilling, were the exact words used. With the incoming comet presenting a pretty serious deadline, the easiest and swiftest response was a mission manned by a combination of both drillers and astronauts, rendering Affleck's question moot. Number 3. Why didn't Marty's parents recognise him as Calvin Klein, Back to the Future? Every single story that encompasses some sort of time travel will leave itself open for scrutiny, even arguably the most famous and popular one of all time. However, one of the biggest sticking points with Back to the Future isn't even a flaw. Marty McFly goes back in time and helps his parents get together in the past under the guise of Calvin Klein. Then Marty grows up to look exactly the same as he did as Calvin Klein. The internet loves to point out that surely his parents should recognise that the two supposedly separate people are identical and that questions would be raised. In short, the answer is no. It's not like Calvin was a close friend or family to the couple. The movie shows that he was only in their lives for a grand total of eight days, and so by the time they have Marty years later, chances are they wouldn't remember what Calvin looked like well enough to question it, if at all. Back to the Future screenwriter Bob Gale added to this explanation when speaking to The Hollywood Reporter, making the very good point that if the choice is between thinking their son travelled back in time, or that there's a slight resemblance between him and someone they knew years ago, if they remembered what he looked like at all, they would probably just assume the latter and get on with their lives. Number 2. Why didn't they move next to the waterfall, A Quiet Place. The premise of A Quiet Place is a terrifying one and made for a fantastic movie. It follows the family of protagonists who try to survive in a world inhabited by monsters who will attack and kill anyone and anything at even the slightest sound. It's a bleak world and as the family had already lost their young son to the monsters, they knew more than anyone the importance of keeping quiet, in spite of the baffling decision to have a baby in such an environment. There was though one place where John Krasinski's character was able to take his son and speak to him. They went to a nearby waterfall, where the father revealed he was able to safely shout at the top of his voice. The noise of the rushing water masked the noises he made, which has led some to believe the fact that they knew about this and yet chose to stay where they were rather than the perceived safety of the waterfall's vicinity is a plot hole. However, the answer is right there on the screen. The family lived on a farm and were for all intents and purposes self-sustaining, which they understandably valued more than being able to speak freely. Then there's the fact that there was absolutely nowhere to live and no shelter by the water, so it was never a realistic option. Ever tried building a house without making any noise? That would be impossible. Number 1. Why wasn't Daniel disqualified, the Karate Kid? Some plot holes are ignored by those who made the errors, while others attempt to explain the thinking and the logic behind such perceived flaws. A famous plot hole from the Karate Kid, however, was leaned into and formed a big part of the spin-off series Cobra. Kai. After fighting their way through the All Valley Under 18's karate tournament brackets, Ralph Macchio's Daniel LaRusso met his rival Johnny Lawrence in the final, earning the winning point with a crane kick to the face. This is widely believed to have been an illegal kick and should not have won Daniel the match. This is a point raised throughout Cobra Kai and even Ralph Macchio himself agrees. Still, there is literally no reason given within the context of the movie to believe Daniel did anything wrong. Throughout the tournament, there were multiple kicks to the face that went unpunished, simply because they are perfectly legal within the format. Not only was it never stated by anyone that Daniel's kick was against the rules, but when Abby explained the rules in the first place, she outright confirms that hits to the head were okay. Finally, at the end of the movie, Johnny congratulated Daniel on his victory along with everyone else, which doesn't seem like the actions of someone who felt they unfairly lost their chance at winning the tournament for the third time in a row. As I mentioned at the beginning, this is not the only video we've done on this topic, so for the original video, click the link on the screen now.